All right, so we're on Alfred Adler now, who founded a school of thought called Individual Personality. Now, I probably should have mentioned this way at the beginning of the neoanalytic chapter, but I just wanted to mention it now that all of these researchers, or uh, not researchers, um, theoreticians, were part of what was called the Vienna School, um, and they were all in Vienna, Austria. This was, you know, turn of the 19th century and into the, you know, 1920s and 30s. Um, and they would often gather together and they would have meetings. They would talk about their ideas and um, things like that. And so everybody started off in the group saying, wow, Freud's got great ideas. And then these are the famous members of the society who said, I have, a, I have an idea too. You know, like I want to change this theory a little bit. Um, and like I said before, one by one, they each got kicked out of the group for, you know, being heretics and not following, you know, Freudian dogma. Um, so Adler, um, his big differences surrounded, he's going to sound a little bit like Horni, I think you're going to think. Um, but instead of being based on sex differences, he's going to be talking about based on power differentials. Um, so he introduced the idea of um, you know, inferiority being really super powerful, feelings of helplessness, feelings of powerlessness, feelings of imperfection are what he means by inferiority. And he talked about something called the masculine protest. So, and again, he, um, like Freud, these compensation things having to do with, you know, being male or female, um, I mean, being a masculine protester or, or, or like this, um, he thought males and females displayed this. It's not a male protest. It's a masculine protest. So because the person's feeling inferior, they're going to compensate for that by aggressing and dominating others. Um, back in the chapter on Freud, I mentioned that um, Freud thought it was really harmful to have a domineering mother and a passive father. So when we talk about masculine protests, we're not talking about only males can act like this. We're talking about a person who is domineering, um, you know, aggressive. It could be either sex. This could become what Adler termed an inferiority complex. The idea that this becomes one of those neurotic nuggets that Jung talked about surrounding the concept of inferiority. And it becomes the thing that the person's like, they at least are unconscious is very focused on is trying to overcome these feelings of inferiority. Adler said that we all are striving towards some kind of fictional finalism. This is us behaving as if there is a final goal that we're moving toward. Um, we see ourselves in some way. I see a lot of times when couples are getting married, they say that they know that this is the one for them because they see themselves growing old together right? That's a fictional final act, right? Like the final chapters will grow old together. Um, and we behave as if there really is like, that's a goal and it can be done, right? Like we have any control over whether we get to ultimately grow old together with this other person. I mean, we could get hit by a bus and die tomorrow, right? Like we don't really have control over that, but we work as if there is this final goal. It's a, it's healthy to have this fictional final finalism because it can guide our strivings. I mean, let's just stick with the marriage example. If you have this belief that this is the person who you've chosen and that you want to grow old with, it will help you to guide, it'll help guide your strivings towards having a healthy relationship that'll last a long time and, you know, working it out with this person because I have this picture in my mind of you and me sitting in a rocking chair on the front porch, you know, with gray hair and the grandkids coming over. Like this is what I'm, I, I want to have happen and I'm going to continue to strive towards that. It can lead to neurotic clinging though. I mean, what if things, everything else about the relationship is going horribly, but you're like, but I want to grow old with this person. I said, this is who I, well, I'm going to do it. Right. Like if you, even as there's abuse or addiction or other things going on and you go, but, but, but this is the person I picked. I have to do it. I have to do it. Um, it sounds a little bit like a tyranny of a should, doesn't it? You can kind of see how these guys and gals all sort of linked together and um, shared ideas that sound very similar um, to each other. So instead of talking about, you know, an idealized self, Alfred Adler talked about, you know, there's this final, like, I think I know what I'm working towards, right? Like I know what the goal is. 
social interest, he's referring here to um, our tendency to develop friendships, love, concern for society. He said this was an inborn social interest, but it needs to be cultivated, right? That our families need to encourage us to make friends, that our families need to, you know, our families and, and schools and stuff need to encourage us to be, um, you know, charitable towards other people. And, um, you know, to develop love relationships with, you know, platonic friendships, and then also with romantic friendships like these, you have to think about other people besides ourselves, think about society rather than just our own individuality. So he says these are inborn tendencies that need to be sort of the flames need to be fanned by the people around us as we grow up. And by adulthood, this is where we will be. And so some of us probably have more social interest than others of us in part because of the degree to which we were encouraged to do those things final thing I wanted to throw out that Adler introduced was this concept of a style of life. It's, he said, a method of striving for per, per, for perfection. Here we have a little difference from Horni because she was acting as if, you know, if you're going for perfection, it's always bad. But he, uh, Adler said, well, it can be a healthy, you know, striving if um, we're not harming other people, including ourselves, um, right? If we um, are striving to be our best selves, that's a, you know, it's a good goal. But um, he said it can be a neurotic goal if it causes us to be completely self-absorbed and we're not thinking about anybody else. We're only thinking about ourselves and our own needs and, and that kind of thing. Um, so he says it can be healthy. He says it can also go take a bad turn. Um, now, one thing about the style of life that's different from Horni's idealized self and the tyranny of the shoulds is that um, Adler thought that this style of life really was um, coming from inside the individual rather than being imposed by others. Now, the tyranny of the shoulds can be self-imposed also, but Horni was much more emphasizing that we may have internalized other people's, you know, goals and, and um, you know, standards and all those kinds of things, whereas Adler is really emphasizing the idea that this came from inside the person. So what you see here that really differentiates Adler from Horni especially is um, Freud is focusing on the, I just said Freud when I meant to say Adler. Um, Adler is focusing on a lot of these things coming from inside the individual, right? So that's why he called it individual personality, that, that he thought a lot of it was um, sort of predispositions and and things and it's um the own it's inside the, the person their own um inferiority feelings or their own finalism or their own social interests their own style of life all right let's compare him to freud the biggest difference between the two of them really is this focus on everything that was inborn and really motivating was sexual in nature maybe aggressive Adler, on the other hand, he said that the biggest driving motive was really social. That's a big difference, honestly, um, that the, you know, Adler is saying that our relationships with everybody else is more important than what Freud said, which is that our own, you know, pleasure and, you know, our, our own pleasure principle is, is really what's motivating us, right? So, um, I think Freud had, a, even though Adler's was called individual personality, Freud really had a much more selfish, um, self-satisfying model as well, as far as that. And whereas Adler was saying, you know, our goal is to become a member of the group, right. And to be intern integrated with everybody else. All right. Our final theorist in the psycho analytic school, the neo-psychoanalytic, would be Eric Erickson. And some of you may have seen Eric Erickson if you've taken lifespan development, um, because he follows, when I teach lifespan development, he follows us through the entire quarter, because he has these psychosocial stages of development that start in infancy and um, continue on all the way through up until death. Um, so Basically, he says at each stage of development, so we're looking at the first one, infancy, so from birth to about one year, we face some kind of conflict. In this case, it's the conflict between being able to develop tr basic trust for our environment, that's mostly parents, or are we going to 
develop mistrust and think that the environment is not going to be supportive of us and it's not going to take care of us and so on. If we solve the conflict on the positive side, then we will develop that stage's virtue. In this case, we will develop hope. If we solve it on the negative side, we not only don't develop that virtue, but we haven't got as much psychic energy available to confront the next conflict. And so it's going to make it more likely that we'll resolve the next conflict on the negative side. So our next conflict would be um, early childhood. The conflict here is between autonomy versus shame and doubt. Autonomy means trying to gain control over ourselves. So you're going to notice a little overlap here with Freudian theory on the anal stage where self-control is what you're developing, right? Here, we're trying to get self-control and be able to show the environment that we can take care of ourselves, we can do it ourselves. If you've ever seen a two-year-old with their shoes on backwards, you know that they told their mom, I can do it myself, <laughs> Right there. They try to be very autonomous during this period of time and they want to do things that maybe they aren't qualified for, but they want to do it. Now, I mentioned they might not be qualified for it because, like I said, sometimes they, they try to do more than they can. Like my grandson thinks he can pour using a gallon of milk and it's like, sweet pie, you are not even two years old. <laughs> you can't be lifting this this um, gallon of milk yet. Um, but you, I don't ever say that to him because I don't want to encourage shame and doubt. I want to encourage him for thinking he can do it. So maybe I can support the bottom of the of the gallon so that he can have a better chance of lifting it all the way. I discovered you also want to have a little finger in the little uh, grip or else it tips too fast. And next thing you know, you get all over the floor. Grandma learned. But anyway, um, you, know, you want to encourage them in their autonomy with, you know, protections in place. If they if they um, solve it on the positive side, the virtue that they, they develop is will. Will is going to be really important um, for the next stage, which is where, um, you know, between three and six years of age, the, the big conflict is, will they show initiative or will they be developing a sense of guilt over their desires to do things that they're interested in? Um, so you see that during the, the play years that kids do a lot of like whatever they're really, really interested in. Um, and if we encourage them in those things, then they will develop the virtue of purpose. If we, on the other hand, say, put that stuff away, that's pointless. Why are you always playing with that? Um, we can foster guilt. During the school years, the conflict is between industri industry versus inferiority. And the virtue that we can develop is confidence. Uh, sorry, competence. Um, so during the school years, industry is displayed oftentimes by, you know, solving all the math problems on your worksheet or um, cleaning up your room or other things. Um, if you, this is a time when kids make a lot of comparisons between each other. And if they see that their math solutions are always wrong or more wrong than their peers, they can start to develop a sense of inferiority. If on the other hand, they feel like they're measuring up well, then they're going to start to feel competent about what they're attempting to do. Adolescence is the period of time when the conflict is between developing an identity versus being confused. Now, adolescence typically is considered the teen years. Erickson did say that this um, identity conflict can carry through the 20s as a person's really trying to figure out who they are in, in a lot of different ways. Um, are they a um, hard worker or are they kind of lazy? Are they... Um, you know, a person who really likes this kind of music genre or that kind of music genre, or do they like them all? Um, you know, they, the kind of play, person who likes to play sports or not? Are they, you know, like there's so many things to figure out. What, do they really identify with their ethnicity or, or not? Um, there's just a lot of aspects of our identity to be sorting out. And so he said it may take through the 20s to really, you know, settle in on a, a pretty coherent identity. So I just wanted to mention that in case you are past the age of 19 and you're like, I'm not exactly sure on all those things yet. Um, he says that's really normal into your 20s. Now, if you're starting to enter your 30s and you're still really super confused, um, you've probably resolved the conflict on the confusion side. If you can resolve it on the positive side, he says that helps you to develop the virtue of fidelity, which is a nice way of saying loyalty. Um, loyalty is going to be really important for the next stage, which is developing an intimate relationship. Um, and he was really talking back, you, you know, these are people who are products of their time. He was talking about um, a male and a female pairing up and with the prospect of having offspring. It 
it's not a guarantee any male female pairing will make offspring but you know like that's that's the um, model that he was following um, so if you can get into this kind of romantic pair bond he said that you have the ability to develop the virtue of love if not he said if you can't find romantic relationships and and um, and like that you can end up left in isolation um, and so that's going to make it more difficult to do the next thing which is um, the middle years of life are devoted to generativity which is being able to produce um, evidence that you were here you know the easiest way to leave evidence that you were here is to make an offspring right leave your genes here Harder would be things like writing books or mentoring um, children after school or, you know, like finding ways to do that um, so that you can leave a mark. Um, if you can resolve this conflict on the side of generativity, then you can develop the virtue of care. Um, if not, you can stagnate and feel like, you know, why am I here? What is my purpose? What, you know, what's the purpose of life? You know, and you can really start to bog down in that. Um, the final stage is old age, and he said the conflict here is between integrity and despair. Um, so integrity would be represented by being able to look back on your life and say, you know, basically I've lived a pretty decent life. I did the best I could at different junctures. Um, maybe some things could have gone better, but, um, you know, overall I've had a good life. Um, if you can do that, you can develop the virtue of wisdom, where now you can help to mentor the younger generations to realize that, you know, this too shall pass. Um, things like that. Right now, like I said, it's March of 2022 and there is a you know, war going on between Russia and Ukraine. Um, oil prices are soaring. Inflation is enormous. And my young adult children are like, oh my gosh, you know, the world is blowing up. So I sent them a, an article from a magazine that was written in 1973 talking about um, OPEC cutting us off from oil and so we had gas lines where you could only literally buy gas on alternate days and then when it was your day that you were eligible to buy gas you had to sit in lines that like stretched around the block and a lot of people ran out of gas waiting for their turn to go get gas and sometimes the gas station would run out before it was your turn um, you know inflation was enormous the stock market crashed and and didn't recover for like two years and I mean it was just it was awful um, that was my childhood then, of course, we had the 2008 situation. And so I reminded them of that, you know, that this stuff does pass. I'd like to argue that that indicates I might have some wisdom. Um, I'd like to argue I'm not over 65. But, um, you know, with age, oftentimes comes that kind of perspective that you can look back on life and you can say, OK, I'm, I'm starting to see what the pattern was. <laughs> I'm starting to see the, the coherence. Um, if you can't do that, if you look back on your life in your old age and you're saying, oh, if I could only do it over again or if you look back on your life in old age and say, um, I never did anything wrong, you know, I don't know what my kids are complaining about. I did the best I could and they're just, they're just ungrateful. Um, that is a person who's facing death with despair, um, without the integrity that will make um, death less scary. So those are the big stages of psychosocial development for, for Erickson. Um, big difference between Freud and Erickson. Um, Freud had those psychosexual stages and really emphasized the unconscious conflicts. Um, Erickson, on the other hand, had, had the psychosocial stages. So the, you know, the emphasis is different. And he really emphasized social conflicts rather than, you know, unconscious things. Um, so he had this big, big basic difference. So again, um, he was asked not to attend the Vienna Club anymore because he was contradicting Freud. All right, well, that concludes our neo-analytic theorists. Our textbook goes into a lot more detail and background and stuff like that, but I just wanted to give you the basic tenets of each of the theories so that you can have a basic understanding. So um, I will see you next in chapter five. All right.